start. Hi folks, I'm Suzanne Arms. I'm with the Alliance for Transforming the Lives of Children. And I'm here today again in Northern, actually in Southwest Colorado at about 7,000 feet high and the slope of the Rocky Mountains. And I'm talking to an old acquaintance of mine, someone I admire greatly and haven't talked to for at least 40 years. He is an, a retired physician, obstetrician, gynecologist, Murray Enkin. And Murray is right now in Victoria on Vancouver Island. Welcome, Murray. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm good, honey. Can you um, look up at the screen a little bit more? Yeah. Now I can see you. Okay. So I, I wanted to interview you so much because there's only, I wish I could say there were more, but there's only a handful of obstetricians around the world whom I've met who, who I really admire for having been leading edge, um, courageous, pioneers, um, standing out against the, the crowd in terms of giving birth what it really needed, giving babies and mothers what they really needed. And I remember you from when I first met you probably in Australia at the first national home birth conference in Australia. Is that right? Do you think that's where we first met? Your memory is better than mine. <laughs> well, I, re I remember, because you were a speaker, and uh, I think it was about 1978 or 80. So I, I wanted to start by asking, was there anything in your upbringing, in your home or from a religion that taught you to respect biology and biological processes like labor and birth and breastfeeding and wearing babies. Um, was there anything in your upbringing that made you different? <laughs> Don't know. My father was uh, a very good man. Uh, he did a lot of wonderful things after the war, but uh, I don't remember anything particular before. My mother died uh, quite young. Uh, how, uh, how old were you when she died, Mary? I guess about 16 or so. Ah. Where, where were you born? I was born in Toronto. And were you born in a hospital or at home? Oh, yeah. I'm sure it was, oh yes, it was the uh, Toronto General Hospital. Uh-huh. I think most babies were born in the, uh, in the hospital by that time. Yeah, what year was that? Now. What year? But 1924, I was born. 1924, yeah, by that time, not half of them in the United States, but a large preponderance were born in hospitals. The, the uh, big event was 1932, uh, which I'm sure you know all about. Uh, that was the uh, major conference uh, on maternal mortality. No, I don't know about it. Oh yes, it was very important because the New York Academy of Medicine did uh, a conference on uh, maternal mortality and to the shock of the medical profession, they found that the maternal mortality for home birth was much lower than the maternal mortality for a hospital birth. Ah, yes. 
Ah, yes, I didn't know about that one, but I knew the facts. That 1932 meeting was uh, a big breakthrough, I think. What do you think were the results? <laughs> well, the results obviously is what is on right now. Uh, I mean, everything is a result of the past. Right. So did it really change obstetrics in hospitals in Canada, do you think? I don't think so. But it, did, it made a big stink I, at the I don't time. Know what changed uh, the results of obstetrics in, in Canada? Well, you know that t today, midwives in Canada um, legally not only are able to, but are required to be able to practice at home as well as in hospitals. Well, that's, that's fairly recent. Yeah, it is very recent. And it was a, the work of a, an activist midwife to a large part, um, international midwife named Betty Ann Davis and others who lobbied for that. But, you know, back when oh, you were practicing. Please. Betty Ann was from Ottawa. That's right. So you know Betty Ann. Oh, yes. Oh, we, were on, we were on committees together. Oh, did you know her husband, Ken Johnson? No. Ken, well, maybe I did, but... I, you may have, because Ken was an, a Canadian government epidemiologist. And he was very important for doing research. He and Betty Ann did the research on the statistics on the safety of home birth um, for non-nurse midwives in the United States. And, uh, and he also did research that found that secondhand smoke was a direct cause of breast cancer in postmenopausal women. And uh, he wasn't able to get it published in the United States. But uh, it was very important research. So you know Betty Ann. Wow. That's great. So do you remember the story of your birth? Did your mother ever tell you or your father or anybody? No, I don't remember hearing anything about it. What's your gut say? What, what's your intuition or your body hey, say? Well, uh, what does my body say? Yeah, what do you I think heard? happened? <laughs> uh, I don't think it ever said anything. <laughs> do, you, do you have a sense that you were born physiologically, naturally, or with forceps or cesarean? No. Nope. And nobody told you? No. Nope. Do you know if you were breastfed? I suppose most babies were in those days. Uh, 24, yeah, they would have been, in, at least in Canada. So it wasn't anything about your birth or your upbringing that taught you to have respect for the natural biological process. So let's fast forward. You decided you wanted to be a physician. Did you know you wanted to be an obstetrician? No, I, I didn't want to be a physician. Uh, I wanted to be a chemist. Ah. And my father said, okay, if you want to be a chemist, be a chemist, but get your MD first. So I said, okay. I do okay. what I'm told. I got my MD. Um, then uh, I actually do quite remember uh, in medical school, I, I heard the way the nurses and doctors were talking about the women patients giving birth. And I said, I got to do something about that. Were they talking about them in a disparaging way? Yeah. And I said, I got to do something about that. I still remember that. How old were you? How old? 
Yeah. Must have been in your 20s. I guess. I, I was in medical school. Um, what disturbed you was that they were talking about them with a lack of respect? Yeah. And I imagine in those days, a lot of the women had uh, twilight sleep. I suppose. I don't know if you remember that in your training, but when women had twilight sleep, like my mother, they acted very combative and crazy, and they were often tied. Well, down. take it back a little bit further. Okay. Twilight sleep was a great relief to women. Yes. Because? Uh, it, because it made labor painless. Yeah, that's true. And women were really frightened and suffering. And uh, so twilight sleep was a very positive thing in the early days. I remember it was it was heralded as an incredible advancement, both for doctors and for women. No. So when you started your training, or when you trained, you were clearly trained to use twilight sleep. You were trained to do forceps, correct? Well, that was in my obstetrical training. How, so, did, I get, how did I get into obstetrical training? Yeah, how? Um, I'm not even sure. Well, yeah, I guess I can vaguely recall. I, I think it was anger. Because uh, what I was really, I, I only went to medical school because my father made me because right. I wanted to be a chemist. But I remember getting very angry at the way the doctors and nurses were treating women. And I remember saying to myself, I got to do something about that. So fast forward, that was in residency or that was before you even decided to go into obstetric residency? Oh yeah, long before, because all I wanted was to be a chemist. Okay, so this would have been a rotation that you had in medical school. Yeah. Yeah. So what switched you into obstetrics instead of chemists? Well, I was a general practitioner. Oh, uh, what pushed me into obstetrics? Well, I was, I was a general practitioner in a small town called Shonovan. And uh, I don't know, I, I guess I just fell in love with women. <laughs> I don't mean that in a sexual sense. I uh, know. Uh, but I, I'm sort of jumping around. I remember in the Homemakers magazine, there was an article about men who love women and it included Leonard Cohen and me, and I thought I was an awfully good company. <laughs> yeah, I've, I, I have heard people say that, that they went in because they really just had a love of the, the feminine and, and female or, and uh, incredible respect for women's capacity to bring babies into the world. Oh, I don't know whether I thought of it in that, in that sense. Uh, I, I guess I just always was uh, interested in women, and I don't mean that in a sexual sense. I felt an affinity with women. More than with men? Much more. Much more. Yeah. I know a number of very sensitive men who feel the same way. They feel a much stronger affinity with women than men. Yeah. So you were in 
general practice for a long time and then you went into obstetrics, that meant you had to go into a residency in obstetrics, correct? Uh, I was in general practice for quite a while. And well, I basically, I was in a small town and Eleanor, my wife, uh, said um, something to the effect that small town is a bad place for her daughters to grow up because uh, they would soon grow up and leave and I should specialize and go to the city and uh, I said how can I I'm only a small town general practitioner. And she pointed out that in the United States, uh, all the young medical graduates went into the army. So I could get a, a residency in, in obstetrics in the United States because oh. I wouldn't be drafted. So um, there, there was residency. Yeah. So the first thing was to specialize and uh, I got a re residency in Boston. In Boston. And by that time you and Eleanor had what? How many kids? I guess it would be two. And they were both daughters? Both daughters. What kind of births did Eleanor have? Well, <laughs> yes, I remember. <laughs> I remember both very clearly. Uh -huh. I, one was a very traditional birth, birth uh, attended by Dr. Weaver, and I, I wasn't there, of course. Uh, but by coincidence, I was doing an appendectomy in almost the next room. So I saw her shortly after she had given birth. And, wow. um, <clears throat> so that was a, an interesting coincidence. So that would have been about 1944. No, no, 34 was when I was born. I would have been... About 44? 24. I was probably... Well, I think it was 1948. Something like that. 1948. So... No, wait a minute. Yeah. 40, we were married in 1947. I'm so confused. No, that's okay. So it would have been the late forties, probably before your daughter was born. A couple of years after you were married. Was, we were married in nineteen forty-seven. Uh huh. And now Susie was born in Regina with a very conventional birth and a total anesthesia general anesthesia, but no me, I delivered. And uh, that was a very natural birth. It was in a hospital, but the hospital was right across the road from our home. So we had carried on the labor at home. Uh, walked across the road to the hospital, gave birth to Nomi, walked back. <laughs> wow. So she didn't go to a nursery? No. Nomi never went to a nursery. That's wonderful. And did Eleanor breastfeed both, both girls? Oh, yeah. yeah. For, do you remember, a long time or just a few months? Several months. Several months. Several months. So 
this would have been the time when Grantley Dick Reed, Dr. Grantley Dick Reed had, was coming to the United States, maybe to Canada too, to give talks about natural childbirth. Did you ever get to see him? I did, but I, I met Helen Herdman, do you know? No. She was uh, one of the uh, very early adherents of Grantley to Reed. And uh, I had the privilege of meeting her. So. And she was espousing natural childbirth? Yeah. Uh huh. And at that time, you would have been practicing back in Canada, right? I suppose so. Yeah. Well, now, wait a minute. Mm, no, every, everything is so, so confusing. Uh, in Boston, I had... No, Boston was just a regular internship. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, hey, listen, even uh, I'm only 76, you're 95, and I still can't get the dates right, so don't worry about it. Um, so where did your interest in natural childbirth begin? Well, it began with Helen Herdman and Grantley Dick Reed. And were you finding other physicians agreed or were you kind of uh, oddball? I was oddball. In fact, uh, I know that I, I must have been noisy because I, there was uh, a hearing at the College of Physicians and Surgeons uh, because of a complaint about uh, me um, and my advocacy of natural childbirth, and uh, I guess I passed because uh, I kept my license. Well, what were they? What were they investigating? Did they think you were irresponsible, or what? Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I met one of the women in, who in Boston had one of the first, quote, natural childbirths in uh, Boston Hospital in early to mid 50s. But it was everybody, all the doctors wanted to come in and see because it was so rare. <sighs> Were there pivotal moments in your life um, as an obstetrician? or just as a person that caused you to question medicine and um, the domination of obstetrics by men or anything else? Um, no, I, I, I guess it's a corny word and it's so, so overused, but I guess I was in a, a, what I called an iconoclast. I, I was against the idols. And uh, tried to be contrary. But you weren't a Luddite. Were you a Luddite? Those are the folks to hate technology. I, I, I was anti-establishment almost uh -huh. because it was establishment. <laughs> and it just happened that establishment was lots of routine yeah. interventions in birth. Yeah. Got it. So were there some people along the way besides Erdman and Grantley Dick Reed, who inspired you? Well, Helen Herdman was the one that operationalized it. Mm -hmm. um, but I was fortunate enough to go to the first uh, uh, 
meeting of the International ISPARG, International Psychosomatic Obstetrics and Gynecology. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, For that was in ISPARG. And I think that's where everything suddenly came clear to me. And that, do you remember where that was or when it was? It was in Paris. Huh. And that was Fernand Lamaze, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And you you must know about Elizabeth Bing. Sure. Well, Elizabeth was my major influence. She was amazing. I mean, she's the one who, as a physiotherapist, brought the notion of uh, psychoprophylaxis for obstetrics or basically breathing, natural breathing for... um, so Elizabeth, Elizabeth and I were became very close. Ah, she's a wonderful lady. Yes. Yeah, she really started the movement in this country, and I think she started the whole Lamaze organization in this country. Well, Elizabeth and I became very, very close. She was amazing. Yeah. Was there anybody else? Um, in obstetrics or maybe even pediatrics or psychiatry or any other field that really inspired you as a humanist? No, I think Elizabeth was my my main inspiration. She was the main thing. As I say, we were very close friends. I remember seeing you at a conference in uh, Canada, in Vancouver. And um, at that time, you know, I was a photojournalist and I was writing down quotes of things you said. And I remember one of the things that I quoted many times was that a country got the type of birth that it deserved <laughs> based on its values and, and mores and beliefs. And uh, I thought that was very pertinent, that it wasn't, it wasn't by chance that a country ended up pursuing a particular path in how babies were brought into the world and how women were treated. I, I remember, rightly or wrongly, hearing you say that the MD won't get off its throne until women get off their knees. Until women give up. The MD won't get off his throne until women get off their knees. Get off their knees. Whoa. Was it that, at that conference? No. no. I, I don't know where I heard that, but um, I think I attributed it to you. Well, yeah. Well, you know, we have a mutual admiration going, you and I. (laughs) And um, I was always being inspired by other people. Um, And one of the people who inspired me, um, although I didn't inspire him, was a man named Haverkamp. Uh, Dr. Haverkamp. Colorado. I guess so. He did the first research on the safe uh, on electronic fetal monitoring and the benefits. And he thought he was going to find um, he was a clinician, so it was he was an obstetrician that uh, fetal monitoring did a great deal of good. And what he ended up finding and daring, being willing to publish, which stood in direct opposition to his own beliefs, was that electronic fetal monitoring could save the lives of no more than one in 10,000 babies. And in the meantime, it contributed to the problems in birth and deaths of many others. Havercap. Havercap. And I I was so uh, amazed by him. And I was at a conference somewhere. I was going up an elevator. He was going down. And I remember looking over and seeing him. And I said, Dr. Havercap. And he looked at me, Suzanne Arms, he said, you have destroyed women's trust 
in doctors and the elevator, the escalator <laughs> went down. And I was like, I was just appalled because here was somebody who, I think he published in the Journal of Obstetrics um, and he was with Harvard at the time, but he, I felt that he was a real pioneer in research. And um, I, I didn't realize that I was a thorn in his side. I, I guess I was a thorn in a lot of people's sides. Yes, you were. You were a thorn in mine, but in a very positive way. <laughs> I needed a thorn. You needed a thorn. Yeah, but you know, you already were speaking to midwives. You were already speaking about natural childbirth and even um, to women who were having home births. So they obviously spotted you as a renegade and somebody who would stand up for them. And I don't remember any other male obstetricians who spoke as you did. There was one obstetrician at McMaster University, but I'm trying to remember his name in Canada, Eastern Canada, but very rare. So they spotted you. And did you ever attend or see any births at home? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, much later I did, but not. Probably not while I was still at medical school. Uh-huh. Did you notice any striking differences between how women behaved in hospitals versus how they behaved at home? I guess it's, it's, it's too much of a blur. Uh, obviously, I was so prejudiced and... and <clears throat> Uh, I, I, do you know the expression seeing is believing? Yeah. You, you see what you believe. Yeah. You know, so. You see what you believe. You see what you believe. And, and beliefs keep people from being able to open their mind to other possibilities. I can't remember who the scientist was who said, you know, or it's a Buddhist maybe, um, holding a belief automatically keeps you from being open to other beliefs. Well, now, now I'm, sure that's, uh, I'm sure that's true and I held beliefs, so I had a very closed mind. But your beliefs were different from a lot of other obstetricians. I suppose, yeah, well, yes, they were. Yeah. Did you, um, I know that the specialty of obstetrics and the specialty of pediatrics tend to, to be very different and they didn't usually <clears throat> spend a lot of time with each other. You know, the obstetrician would hand the baby to the pediatric staff, <coughs> but they yeah. didn't usually talk to each other. Yeah, my early practice uh, was really birthing women and babies. Uh, I sort of thought in terms of the pregnancy and a few months after birth as being my patients. Did you see women in the postpartum? Did you see them after birth? Yes. And I looked after the mother baby dads. So. The mother baby dyad. Yeah. So so clearly you had some strong feelings about the importance of the mother baby not being separated. Yes. So, uh, <clears throat> I I remember uh, <clears throat> the. At one time, being in favor of the baby in the nursery, because that was the way the woman got some exercise. They were allowed out of bed to get their baby and nurse the baby. <laughs> Otherwise, they were kept in bed. 
Ah, uh, yes, I remember that. That was when my mother gave birth to my brother in '38. She wasn't allowed out of bed for ten days. Right. And then by the time I was born in '44, that was six years later. I think um, the time was shorter. But you know, in the beginning, they could only sit up and hang their legs over the side of the bed. That was their exercise, right? Yeah. Ten days hospitalization after birth. Yep. By which time they lost all their muscles. <laughs> so, if yeah. they're having trouble 10 days after the birth, think yeah. how much worse it would have been if they got up right away. Yeah. And, well, and when, I, when I was born, you know, it was World War II, and a lot of the nurses were off working with the soldiers in, um, in Europe. So there were very few nurses on the floor. And, um, Babies were routinely separated from their mothers after birth, and there was an epidemic of infant diarrhea going around all the hospitals. And um, so I was not allowed to see my mother except from the doorway. And that was, I think, at day three. But I was lucky because I was born a girl, and they hadn't had a girl in a while. So somebody put a bow on my head, taped to my head, and brought me to my mother each day from day three on to be able to look at me. But it wasn't long after that, that somebody had the bright idea of putting the babies with the mothers after birth. And that instantly stopped the infection of, you know, the infant diarrhea. It was caused by being the se by the separation. Now, I you might be able to, who was the obstetrician in Curitiba? Who was the obstetrician who what, hon? In, that lived in Curitiba. He wrote a beautiful article in birth. I don't know. Uh, and I remember traveling to Curitiba just to meet him and uh, that introduced me to the uh, lay midwives in, uh, in northern Brazil. Ah, so you do uh, get to... Passionic. Does the name Passionic mean anything to you? No. Passionic. I remember when Doris Hare had the first uh, National Conference on Maternal Child Health in New York City, and I think there were 1,500 people there. And that was the first time I ever saw Marshall Klaus speak. And when you say Brazil, I'm thinking about Caldero Barcia. Oh, yes. But um, in many ways, Passionic was more influential than Caldero Barcia. Wow. Uh, Certainly, he inspired me more, a lot more. Wow. But uh, how much general, I, I don't know. But, in, you know, in those days, people didn't talk a lot about the sensitivity and consciousness of babies. Do you remember that being discussed in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s? No. No. It's as if they were just the passive passenger yeah. in the birth, you know, which is what they were talked about um, in Delhi, in the Delhi textbooks in 1917, 1918, the passive passenger. And then this whole, I mean, it's not like nobody talked about it. There were Otto Rank and a few psychiatrists who talked about birth, but it wasn't, in terms about the baby and consciousness and birth trauma, it was not really discussed, gosh, till no. 1980s, I think. Uh, did you know Tom Verney? Yeah, very well. Tom yeah. Verney started the Northern a North American version of what was in Europe 
the Association for Pre and Perinatal Psychology. So, and he's still alive and he's still uh, speaking around the world. Yeah, he was very I'm, influential. I'm still alive, but not speaking around the world. Yeah, well, you get to rest. I don't know why he continues to want to speak around the world. I'm sure it's pretty taxing. Yeah, he must be as, almost as old as me. Yeah, I think I think he is. I think he's about 90. Um, how did you feel when you were speaking to midwives and birth activists in those days in the 70s and 80s um, compared to speaking with groups of obstetricians? Was there a marked difference? What did you feel? I did, first of all, I did very little, if any, speaking to obstetricians. Because? They weren't interested in what I had to say. They weren't what? They weren't the least bit interested in what I might have to say. Wow. And those who knew about it would condemn it. Yeah. Well, I can remember uh, being treated very, very hostily by obstetricians after my book Immaculate Deception came out, you know, in 1975. And I had this crazy what a, what, notion. What a beautiful title. <laughs> well, I had That's this great. great book. Yeah. Thank you. Crazy notion that uh, I had found important information and if I shared it, people would want to listen. And that the knowledge that I got from science and all of the evidence that I read and all of the research, that doctors would be really interested. And I found them completely disinterested in what I had to say and inimical to me. Well, what we want uh, is evidence that corroborate our beliefs. Yeah, we do. Uh, Michelle Odant, the French obstetrician, talks about it as um, research that corroborates our beliefs versus cul-de-sac research, which he describes as research that gets sidelined into a little, walled off into a cul-de-sac and doesn't go anywhere because it runs counter to the beliefs of the society. And I thought that was very interesting. He's, ni he's 90 years old, by the way, this year. A oh, young fellow. A young fellow, yes. Um, so, yeah, I can remember speaking to a group of obstetricians and I don't even remember why I got invited because I was seldom invited um, to a county obst obstetric group in the San Francisco Bay Area, and there were two brothers who were obstetricians. And I, I don't remember who introduced me, but one of the brothers stood not far behind me, making funny faces and <laughs> horns over my head while I was speaking to the obstetricians, just like a fourth grade kid, you know? <laughs> I had I had a hard time. Life, life is funny. Life is very funny. Uh, and sometimes your enemies become your friends. Yes. And actually the people who disagree most with what uh, rebels and iconoclasts think often become their friends. The people who are more dangerous are the ones who don't form strong opinions and stand at the sidelines and uh, just don't get involved in any way because you, you can't count on them. You, you, it, a good enemy is always much a much wiser person to, to know than yeah. somebody who you can't count on. So where do you feel obstetrics went wrong, if it went wrong? Well, I guess everything goes wrong. Um, I, I, I guess I think a, a birth is 
what I had with Nomi. Your second child. Yeah. I mean, first of all, she was my daughter. And she just slithered into my arms and it was so beautiful. Just nice. I enjoyed it. I think she enjoyed it. She cried, but, but I think she still enjoyed it. That's a real sacred yep. experience. Yeah. yeah, it was a beautiful experience. Certainly it was to me, and she says it was to her. I've heard obstetricians who became uh, real strong supporters of natural childbirth, home birth, midwives, breastfeeding, close attachment, talk about the, uh, the births they witnessed either of their own child born spontaneously with no drugs or going to their first home birth and having that be an absolutely transformative experience. I don't know which, where my transformative experiences came out, but they, they transformed. Yeah. Well, thank you for speaking with me. I, I consider it a real blessing that I had this excuse to track you down and, and then read some of the writings that you've been doing over the last few years. And then this film project came up and I immediately realized I wanted to interview you while you're still on this side of whatever exists on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> or, or doesn't. Or doesn't. Yes. Yeah. So bless you, Mary. Thank you for I, all of you, the midwives. You, you've more than made my day. You've made really? Oh. Is, is this recorded? Because I, I, I'd love Bridget to hear this interview. It is recorded, and um, I'll get you a copy of it as soon as I can. All right? I think Bridget will enjoy it. Wonderful. Thank you, love. Thank you. Many blessings. Thank you, Suzanne. Ciao. Ciao. Ci vediamo. Ci vediamo. We'll talk again. <laughs> <laughs>